This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E dot com. Okay, everybody, we're in uh, we're in our remote field studio in South Texas, uh, maybe forty minutes from Brownsville, Texas, fifteen minutes from Raymondville, Texas, four hours and ten minutes from Austin, Texas, and about four hundred yards from our last remote studio, <laughs> <laughs> and four hundred yards from our last remote studio and today. We're in e. We're in what I would call a post rut environment. Um, deer seasons. Deer season is generally closed unless you have. We're not deer hunting, but deer season's closed. But I think that some uh, there's some kind of deal with depredation permits where depredation permits are still valid, but it's generally shut down to the point where we're watching a buck who is packing around one antler and we just saw three bucks one still had two antlers two had zero antlers and we're just basically going to run this podcast until that antler falls off (laughs) and then Seth's going to run over and retrieve it (laughs) Uh, it's windy yeah some gusts of wind there's your one antler buck. Yeah, he is like very curious about what's happening over there. Well, yeah, he's probably never been to a live podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he's not looking at us though. Oh, oh, he's looking their direction. Yeah, I can see a couple buzzards. Um, just to set the scene, Crin just tried to catch an armadillo, <laughs> but a bastard. <laughs> called in a javelina. Yeah, we just called in a javelina that about ran us over. Yep. That, that was the voice <laughs> of special guest Cameron Haynes, who felt that. Corinne, in pursuit of the armadillo, he felt that she hesitated. (laughs) (laughs) You never see a lion, mountain lion, halfway chase something and be like, oh, oh, no, I'm doing it. No, you're right. I did. I hesitated. That's true. When when the lion goes, he's going. (laughs) I mean, there's no hesitation. I didn't want to hurt him. He's like, the lion's like, that might get hurt. That yeah. might go away. Yeah. <laughs> lions, that might get leprosy. <laughs> lions don't have empathy. So she hesitated. No, you're right. <laughs> and then we uh, re- earlier tested the metal of uh, Seth and Max and found out that they lack metal. <laughs> Listen, I think when we you test re- someone's metal, you're testing their M E T T L E, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You're not testing their M E T A L. Wow. I think we need to review the footage because I think Max did a lot more jumping I, than I, I did. I definitely did. We, <laughs> we're doing an experiment did. where you play a dis- – we're going to play some more distress calls in a minute here. We did an experiment where you play a distress call to a pack of javelinas. And I was telling these guys that, in my experience, 25% of the time they'll charge. And, um, and I spooked them before I could get where I wanted to get played the distress call and we got one two he didn't quite charge he was pissed yeah he, and he was, came in and he came in. and he came in and tested uh max's metal <laughs> and found it to be soft well <laughs> found, found the metal to be malleable i'm just saying i was filming and i was looking at the screen and he looked bigger than you. <laughs> and then i look up and he's like right there and i'm like Oh, yeah. okay. His metal is aluminum foil. <laughs> <laughs> His M E T T L E is S O F T. Okay, this is probably not going to work because we're making a shitload of noise. But twenty five percent of the time, it works every time. You know, mm-hmm. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff first. We're going to hit this. Let me see how loud this is. So, we did Squeaky Jack. That was Squeaky Jack on the Havelina. That responded and right now we're gonna hit i'm thinking shelter belt max shelter belt yeah or tnt tnt all right that's another good one afraid of tnt which would be a uh rabbit in distress you know here this is a we're uh we're using a lucky duck revolt caller 
and we're in the just the so sounds that come with it. And I'm in the cotton tail folder. And within the cotton tail folder, I have cotton ball, like ball wool, like B A W L. Like uh -huh. you're crying. Like you're crying. Not yeah. like I've not like you're applying makeup. I have shelter belt, TNT, silly rabbit, high pitch, on and on, down to Bugs Bunny and Skid Row. We're gonna lay out some TNT. We're gonna do. We're gonna talk over it. I think I got it far enough away where we can talk over it. We're gonna do volume ten. Just don't turn it towards us. I'm not gonna do the the turnaround, and we're gonna hit sh TNT and see what we got. Oh, we can easily talk over that. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Okay, we're gonna let that run a while. <laughs> now, with that on, I need stay ready with that long lens. Oh, oh my goodness! Oh, my There's goodness. no way if a coyote comes ripping in here. There's no way what? I don't think I can get on him with that big lens. You might, maybe. So, like I was saying, join the day by Max Barta. Seth Morris, myself, Karen Schneider, Hog, Hog Slayer, Karen Schneider. <laughs> From the last time we were in our studio down the down the row there. And Cameron Haynes. And we're going to do a couple little quick talking points. Now, Seth, I, had, I don't know if you're aware of this. I've been meaning to tell you this. Hmm. A listener wrote in. And, and uh, it's apropos of being in the outdoor studio. Because when we were in our other studio down the way there... Uh, you did. You were setting the scene similar to how we just set the scene now, and you set the scene with a rattling sequence. Okay. Yeah, 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 I remember. So this. a gentleman was. How's the how's the wind killing us? The wind's not great. It's not great, but maybe we can just be cognizant of where we turn our heads sometimes. Uh, a gentleman wrote in that he was listening to that episode, and during your rattling sequence, a deer ran by. <laughs> oh yeah, Kern sent that. And I thought that it was really cool, and then I realized he was driving, which makes me think that it was purely coincidental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. I don't luck. mean to not. I don't mean I know, to knock you uh, down. Well, when I I was reading that, Corinne forwarded that email on, and I had, had thought that I had rattled in a buck. I did too. I read it right. twice Speaker. before I realized you didn't rattle in yeah. a buck. And then yeah, then realized he was driving. I didn't realize that until after I forwarded it to you. Uh, another piece of listener feedback um, that's appropriate because we're in hog country. Is we reported repeat. Listen, let me walk you back through some history on on the pig called the lipstick pig or floppy. <laughs> we a long time ago did a call out where we were looking for great trail cam photos, crazy trail cam photos, and a guy writes in and he sends in a picture of a pig with what I said looked like he had his lipstick out. So a pig that was, or I felt that the pig looked aroused, and we then did a clarification that. Um, not that Corinne's particularly sensitive, but we did a thing that, like, a great trail cam photo, a crazy, a crazy trail cam photo is not that a pig has his lipstick out. That's just, you know, and we were trying to define what we <laughs> meant by a great trail cam photo. <laughs> he wrote in to say, you got it all wrong. It stuck out. <laughs> <laughs> it's always like that. So we had a veterinarian on, um... We had a veterinarian on the show, Davina, Dr. Davina Spencer from Virginia Beach. And she told us all about an ailment. What was that, that ailment called? Is that that buck right there? Um, Paraphimosis. Yeah. Yes. She told us, if you listened to that episode, you heard it. She told us about paraphimosis. And paraphimosis is that. And she has dealt with this frequently, as she explained on the show. She's dealt with this frequently. Or I shouldn't say frequently. She's dealt with this with dogs and talked about how to treat it with dogs and and then worst case scenarios they've had to do um, like a penis removal on the dog and sort of cut things and tie things in place and it basically makes like a little like a little pee hole at the hide for it well then the guy writes back <laughs> once we clarified that he then writes back that he has gone and shot floppy <laughs> <laughs> So the last floppy. photo we get of Floppy is it laying on his garage floor. And 
when they skinned it and butchered it, he found that its bladder was, quote, I want to get like, this right. Very, very full. Was, quote, hugely full of yeah. urine. Yeah. Really? Hugely full of urine. And he, he, uh, he, he feels that it was so full, alarmingly full, that perhaps that uh, he couldn't urinate unless he had a high pressure. Right. You know what they call that? Uh-uh. P-H-O. What's that mean? Piss hard on. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, like when you wake up in the morning, sure, like, God, yeah. I got to piss. Sure. So here as I'm looking at a picture. I'm looking at a picture of him sitting here in the garage. Yeah, for our audience, oh, we'll, we'll have, we'll have like Phil that. put this up on that video. Thing, but, um, yeah, yeah they've thing's... got a measuring stick. So it I measures. put the wrong. I would have put that picture up. It would have done. That thing's been dragging Jeez. in the dirt. Ooh. Yeah. yeah, bad deal. Yeah, Steve, God. maybe you put this Ouch. on IG too. But well, yeah, there we go. Great. I put it up and I put the wrong photo up. Oh. I was going to do further reporting on my uh, phantom groin pain. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> We've covered it. No, but somebody wrote in about it. Multiple people have written yeah, in okay. about my phantom <laughs> groin pain. And I'm like, I don't need to get into it anymore. I'm, I'm all better. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's someone wrote in. And this is the interesting thing. I was telling the story of my father attempting to neuter his cat, Fig the Cat. He tamed a feral cat with fish heads, and it became the family cat. And one day he wanted to get it neutered, and he took it to a hog farmer buddy of his who's neutered hundreds of hogs, and, fig the, and they put it in a gunny sack and cut a hole in the gunny sack and attempted to neuter it and the cat fought him off as you one never would. heard you want to talk about a distress call <laughs> and it only lasted like a short period of time and they're like never mind and then the cat lived the rest of his life intact um a guy wrote in saying that uh, a a veterinarian wrote in 27 years as a veterinarian and he has neutered untold numbers of tomcats. And he also goes on to say, I have spent my entire career listening to men tell me, <laughs> I've spent my entire career listening to men tell me they'll just stick that tomcat in a boot and do it themselves instead of paying me to do it. Usually the wife looks at him, then me, then rolls her eyes and schedules the appointment. I have never once known a person from this generation or the prior who could neuter a cat without <laughs> veterinary help. Cattle, hogs, sheep, goats, horses, no problem. Cats, no way. It was refreshing to hear a more realistic take on the topic. Man, it would be intimidating to do a horse. I feel like. I wouldn't do a cat. Well, you're an honest man. Also related to Texas, we have there's a news item, and this news item was reported in the Wall Street Journal, and it was about. I'd be curious to get your opinion about this. Uh, any anyone who's got an opinion about this, I'd be happy to hear it. Cause I'm I'm un, I'm undecided. A county in Texas. Okay, what county is this? Brazonia County, Texas, south of Houston. There is a plan from a biomedical research firm that owns a 500-acre parcel. Okay, so Brazonia County, south of Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Biomedical research firm. Charles River Laboratories, all right? They own a 500-acre parcel in what sounds like a quiet, nice little community. Their plan is to build a facility that will house 43,200 monkeys that then can be sold for animal research. Locals, I want you to take a guess. Locals are... <laughs> Excited. Pissed. Excited? A or B, not excited. I'm glad I don't live there. 43,000 primates 
Okay. Now, so you can guess that PETA is not crazy about it. Uh, the chosen site borders land owned and protected by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Nature Conservancy, and the San Bernard National Wildlife Refuge. Locals affected, including the locals affected, include veterinarians and directors of conservation organizations who are now speaking out to voice their opposition to the facility. Locals in Brazonia County would be a little slice that think they have a little slice of Texas solitude away from the hub of Houston, and they want to know how much racket. How much racket? I'm trying to curious about the sentence. How much racket does forty three thousand monkeys make? Wouldn't it be mm-hmm. how much racket? No, does. they used it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How much racket does forty three thousand monkeys make? I'm sure they're not quiet. A shrimper had that to say. Hmm. He owns eleven hundred acres nearby. Another neighbor. I thought this would be a place to get away from everything. Now <laughs> a monkey farm is my neighbor. <laughs> Says a retired veterinarian who owns 900 acres. Um, people worry about their uh, property values plunging. Now, here's where you get into this whole thing. Like, I would figure, when I, I'm not a Texan, far from it. But when Texans like to think of Texans, they like to think of people doing what they want on their own land. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would agree with that. Don't mess with Texas, the Republic of Texas. Yep. Keep Texas weird. Mm-hmm. No, that's not a thing. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So this throws you into a, this throws you into a bind. Because on one hand, you might fancy yourself like a property rights person, but then on the other hand, you get you throw the NIMBY thing into it. Not yep. that's that the acronym for not in my backyard. Yeah. So you're like, in theory. I'm a pro property rights person, but not when it comes to putting monkeys by my house. <laughs> is this is just a private company doing this? Yeah, it's a private company doing it. It's not a government research facility. But like I don't judge NIMBY stuff because everybody has a little bit of NIMBY mentality, but it does, it creates a problem. Because if you'd have gone previously and asked these individuals, if you'd have gone to this, you know, I don't mean, you know, I don't know the guy, it's probably great. The shrimper that has 1,100 acres, the retired vet that has 900 acres. If I'd have gone and said, knocked on the door and said, do you feel like people should be able to tell you what to do on your property? They'd have said, hell no. Or no, they would have said, hell no. How would they have said it? Uh, probably a little deeper voice than the first one you did that you <laughs> just did. Like good t- they would have said, hell. They would have yeah, said, like, be like, hell no. no. Hell no, man. He sounded like hell no, uh, It wouldn't have been Biden. <laughs> no. no. That's not Biden. <laughs> yeah. Hell no, man. No, it would have been, hell no, partner. Yeah. Hell no. Yeah, yeah. I kept thinking of Parker Hall when he's like, shit no, man. <laughs> yeah, but he's not from Texas. I know, but he's south. Yeah. And they all sound the same. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so this is a stumper, but I can tell you that as much as I might be like a little bit of a, you know, generally simp- like generally sympathetic to, not generally, sympathetic to private property rights up to the point where you're doing environmental damage to like neighbors. Like meaning if I own a spot and I decide I'm going to dump you know, arsenic in the creek because it's my property. And then the guy down the creek on the next property is like, dude, you just threw arsenic in the creek and now it's all over my property. Yeah. Right. But the monkey thing, I don't know. What do you think about that, Cam? Well, how would you roll on that? You're the neighbor of the monkey man. I don't want 43,000 monkeys <laughs> in my neighborhood. So you'd be no. I'd be a no. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I just, there's, I just there's have, limits to I would everything. be a hell no partner. <laughs> <laughs> no. I just think it, it's inevitable that some of those things are going to get out. Yeah. And then what? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? You got good? Planet of the Apes. Yeah. It's not like they, they get out in Montana and they just freeze to death, you know? Yeah, that's so true. Like, no. That's they why they're out, putting them there because it's a good environment for yeah, them. Yeah, they're going to get out down here and like and establish a, a population. This is, an, like. this is yeah. an especially appropriate conversation to have here because if you sit here for an hour, we you're might see a monkey. <laughs> you're going to see three things that did get out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Which is more than three. Nilgai, water buck, 
We saw oh, a, we saw a kudu, kudu. Today. A kudu. <laughs> yeah. red lechwe. Is that the yeah. am I saying that right? I'm not These sure. are all Maybe. animals that run around in this region, not fenced from place to place, free range. So stuff gets out in Texas. Bigfoot question. Is it real? No. It's a reasonable okay. question. And it's based yeah. on that that bear Bigfoot. So yeah, we covered on the probably the we covered on one of the goofiest things ever, and I'll recap it. So <laughs> listeners who already heard it, bear with me. A researcher was looking at was trying to find correlations between prevalence of Bigfoot sightings and abundance of black bears. Which <laughs> is fine. Sure. I don't <laughs> care. Um and they pointed out that the higher density of black bears you have, the higher density of Bigfoot reportings you have. But then, as I postulated, their friend or a colleague or something said, eh, I mean, that's kind of pointless, that research. So then they said, with a, it seemed with a straight face, they say this could be helpful for bear conservation because you could look and see a decline in Bigfoot reportings and translate that to a decline in black bear numbers. So instead of counting black bears, why not just count Bigfoot sightings? <laughs> Which felt to me like a stretch. Yeah. That felt to me like a, I'll just say it. That felt to me like a dumb idea. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no offense to the, you know, minor offense to the person. <laughs> Someone wrote in, would you consider Bigfoot to be a potential vector for trichinosis? <laughs> oh, Yeah. It depends that they're herbivorous. They gotta be. Then no. Or no, no, no. They're no, no, no. omnivores. Om, yeah, they're omnivores. I, I would think. Like when you think of a Bigfoot, you think of an omnivore. Yeah, like he's gonna take a. He's gonna. He's, he's gonna, gonna take a jackrabbit. He's gonna take a bite of a deer and then like have a couple berries. You think so? Yeah. Uh. So then that would put him in the yes. But he's not going to get it from a jackrabbit. He would have to be get eating, and he'd yeah. have to eat, eat another. He'd have to eat another bear. omnivorous animal. They don't overlap. Bigfoot. Do they? Do they eat bear? What? Bigfoots. <laughs> yeah. What if those re researchers See? came across someone who said they saw yeah. a Bigfoot eating a bear? What would that or do to their boar. research? <laughs> <laughs> Skew it. That'd throw bit. it off. They'd be like, so does this mean there's a lot of bears or not no. many? Um, yeah, if they eat bear, sure. And then that's a good question. It's just we need to have more research uh on Bigfoots. <laughs> and then they're saying would um if Bigfoot is a hominid, and it is, would the flavor profile be similar to pork since many cannibals have referred to human meat as long pig? Great question. Huh. That was from Rob and Jason. They had to put their heads together. <laughs> <laughs> Rob and Jason. They had to co-work that. They had to work that one up together. Yeah. Took the two of them. They met over they met over coffee. <laughs> That's great. More like brews. So we've been covering uh, a little bit just just cuz it's fun sort of like housekeeping. Uh yeah, odd little issues having to do with uh odd issues having to do with TSA taking your guns, uh, knives, and ammo. Um, I just recently had to throw a knife in the trash. Did you? Going through TSA. Bummer. Yeah. You didn't hide it in a bush? Hide it in a potter well, plant? Well, you know where it was? In, uh -uh. in the Philadelphia airport. Or you weren't going back? N no. I was deep in line, and there was no... Yeah, I wasn't going back. There was... It was... What you kind didn't of knife? Say it. it was a, a bench-made bug out. You threw it in the trash? I... Wow. You could have said to someone like, hey, can you hold my place in line? I need to go bury my knife <laughs> in well, a potted I, plant. <laughs> I, was, I was running late, too, at the time. So it was, I didn't have too many options. This gentleman has this to say. I'm going to skip ahead to his name. Oh, Tucker. Great interview, Tucker, with Putin. Yeah. Was, <laughs> <laughs> fresh off his interview with Putin, he has to say, I was listening to the episode that y'all were doing in the bus, talking about TSA stories. Well, get this. I like that. The story where he says, well, get this, that gets, my, that gets me, me attention. 2019, I got married. When I got married, we ran out of alcohol. So one of the guys that was a friend of the family went and got more alcohol. Sounds like your wedding. 
Needless yeah. to say, I drank a little too much <laughs> for four roses that night. So we got home about 2 a.m. and we had to get up at about 5 a.m. to get to the airport on international flight to Jamaica. He, he He's like E.E. E. Cummings. He uses no uh, punctuation. On international flight to Jamaica. Now I say international because that's very important. Noted. Because 5.30 a.m. I woke up to my 4.45 alarm blaring and phone blowing up, still drunk, and my Uber driver calling me since 5 a.m. to see if we were still going to the airport. So we jumped out of bed, threw our bags in the car, and raced down on an hour drive to the International Terminal in Atlanta for a 7 a.m. flight and realized that we're not flying to Jamaica. We're flying to Charlotte, and then we're flying to Jamaica. So we're in the wrong terminal. So we hop a bus to the domestic terminal. By the time we get there, we've missed our flight. Then they got to find us the next flight to Jamaica two hours later. So here I am, still drunk in the airport, <laughs> going through security. Getting all this? Yep. 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 Got it. I throw my backpack on the belt. It goes through the x-ray scanner. And I'm watching the guy looking at the screen and his face turns sour. They move my backpack off the side of the belt. A lady goes and looks at it and brings my bag over so she can search it. I said, yeah, no problem. She starts unzipping zippers and then pulls out a full clip, 50 rounds, 15 rounds of 45 ACP that was sitting in an inside pouch of the outside zipper of my bag. So at this point, I feel like I'm about to pass out because, you know, obviously I'm going to prison. <laughs> so look at her and I go, oh, shit, you can keep that. To which, she <laughs> to which she looks at me for a couple agonizing seconds, which felt like minutes, and says, have a nice day. Throws that mag in the trash and lets me go. He said that that dose of serenade as an added point, this is something interesting. Not serenade, adrenaline. <laughs> Sobered him up. Oh. So if you ever, I don't drink anymore, but if you ever feel like you're too drunk, just have Do someone that. scare you real bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a lucky son of You'll a be gun. Sober. Yeah. I feel like he would at least got pulled in the back and got like a question, a pat down, you know? No, Maybe they tell. that lady liked him for some reason. Now, when that happened to me, I had they, the cops came, they took me in the back room. Just for ammo or a gun? One shotgun shell. Whoa. And they knew I they like they knew that I I was like, dude, I'm so sorry. I was hunting tarm again with my brother. Um you know, and they're like, Yeah, obviously, dude, but now we gotta do all this stupid right. shit, you know, and they were, that was their attitude. It was like, Oh, come on, man. They didn't have to, they could throw it in the trash. Uh, yeah, right. no, apparently right. I know Just the like truth. Her, right? They could have yeah. said, Never mind, uh -huh. throw it in the trash. So yeah. you had your shotgun shell in your chat or your or backpack. Okay. I was like using my day pack hunting and then I like unday packed my day pack and use it for carrying my stuff. Cause you can check shotgun shells, can you? I know, but it was in my carry on. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm just clarifying. You yeah. can. Oh yeah, okay. for sure. Okay. For sure. I've, I've flown to a place before and got there, started going through my carry on looking for something and realized that I had a knife in there that mm -hmm. made it through security. Yeah. I've done that with broadheads. Yeah. Huh. I had broadheads in my carry on. And made it through. Mm-hmm. Another gentleman, part two. I know this has become a topic that has been revisited several times, but after donating a knife to a trash can, I think I found a better solution than has been mentioned so far. Are they coming in? No, I think that's the call. Sorry. You're no. getting ready to run? No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Uh, <laughs> referring to when Max was really trying to get out of the way. I have zero exper by the experience with the javelina. So. <laughs> Solution two. After stepping out of the shuttle bus, I realized I still had two knives on my person. <laughs> Still, he got rid of some, but still had two. <laughs> I refused to trash two perfectly good knives. He's like a he's like a gunfighter. I refused to trash two perfectly good knives, so I asked the bus driver if he could take them back to my car and hide them for me. 
This technique may have been discovered already because he promptly produced an envelope for the knives and said they should be tucked under my windshield wiper when I returned. Oh, nice. Good guy. I gave him a tip. When he returned, my knives were, my knives were safe and sound. Oh. Huh. Man. So you were like giving that. really helpful hot tips yeah. to America. There's lots right. of options that I didn't know about. Well, yeah. that was before he was at TSA, though. He realized he had the knives. Yeah, right. yeah. It's, it's when you're at right. TSA, you're screwed. It's not a T. It's more of an airport. Yeah, it's more of an airport story. So, uh, Cam, lay off me your your. What's your previous hog hunt experience? I gather you're not like a passionate, dedicated, lifelong hog hunter. Uh no. I mean, I've killed I've killed a number of hogs, but it was uh yeah. I just like bow hunting, so mm-hmm. I'll bow hunt pretty much anything. And, and where where would you where have you done your pig hunting? California. Okay. Yeah, Northern California. It's a different yeah. scene. It's a much different pig hunting scene in California. Um, I mean, they run them. They run them more like a. They run them more like a game animal. God, now I can't even remember. Well, they uh, have like you. You have to get like a, there's get like tags. tags. Yeah, you get tags for them. Hmm. Um, I can't there's remember. There's some hurdles now. to jump through. Yeah, it was that was my first out of state hunt because it was. We was drew, it really? Yeah, it was in like ninety. Two maybe, uh, how, thirty-two years ago. Uh huh. Me and Roy went down to Wairika and uh, remind people who Roy is. Uh, Roy is my buddy. He got me started bow hunting. Roy Roth. Um, and uh, yeah, he passed away in twenty fifteen. But we did a lot of hunts in between from that time when I started in nineteen eighty nine to when he died in twenty fifteen, and that was our first out of state hunt. We could drive there from home in Oregon. And you went there to hunt pigs. To hunt pigs. Yeah, we. And that was with dogs, actually. So we were, oh, yeah. they had them bait up in the brush, and I was on my knees in the brush, dogs and pigs running around, and I shot this pig at about, I don't know, I don't know, eight feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I went down before, another, or I mean other times, and then spot and stock, like kind of in the rolling hills, kind of outside of, one time outside of Sacramento, and uh, then another time more south of there, but Yeah. The, the first one I got was north of Sacramento. Okay. And s- spot and stock. Like green rolling hills, kind you know. of? Yeah. Well, in the right time of year, other times of year is dry, but right. like, like speckled with uh, oaks. Yeah. You know, and a lot of poison oak. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a real hassle to hunt there. And they had they been dug in where they were bedded and you kind of stuck You'd along get the creek? Out, I'd get out early. In the, it was hard. It was like, I don't want to say it was hard. Not hard hunt. Not like hunting here. It was, you had to like think. Yeah. And try. Mm-hmm. And the the trick was to catch them headed to bedding at yep. daybreak, or to catch them popping out of bedding in the evening. And it was it felt more like a glassing spot and stalk deer hunt in this area to the point where um, a, a friend of mine from school, her dad ran cattle on a number of places, and she always said, "Oh, you can hunt, come hunt pigs," but he to the point where he would sometimes wonder if he even had any pigs hmm. at on the ranches at the time because of they were so subject to water. Um, and when, when stuff was dry, he felt that they were gone. When stuff was wet, they were there. So I never saw anything like what we saw today for some years because for a while that was the pig hunting I did. Yeah. Was was like, I hope I get one pig hunting in California. Yeah. I went another time with this. He was a pretty well-known bow hunter at one time, Ray Howell. And we were down and they were in like a, uh, in the oats, like a like a wheat or a wheat field, and uh, it reminded me of hunting carp when the carp are spawning and they're like kind of in the water, and you can see the grass kind of moving yeah. around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you'd see the you know the the wheat moving around, and you're like, oh god! So you sneak up there, and you'd get. I mean, sometimes from me to Corinne. Oh no! Yeah, kid. and because they're crazy. They just don't know. They can't see any. They can't see anyway. Yeah. But they couldn't hear. Couldn't whatever. You get the wind right. You get right there, and you just kind of sh- almost shoot them like a carp. And I shot this one one time. We were filming it. And I have the footage somewhere. But it it ran right at me and ran between my. Le- I went like this, kind of raised one leg between my legs, and we were like, <laughs> had the we had got a big kick out of that. But <laughs> for a moment, I felt like Max. <laughs> I was gonna say I definitely would have jumped in. He felt like a soft, yeah. a soft metal, a soft metal, <laughs> aluminum foil. Yeah, yeah. So <sighs> that, it was pretty fun. So I've I don't know how many I've killed, but I haven't done it in a while. This you know this invite came 
you and Joe had planned on doing this, or you planned on doing a deer hunt that fell through, then this, and then, you know, you and Joe somehow invited me, and so here I am, and didn't plan on it, but I'm very thankful that I'm here. When I asked Joe, I said, do you think Cam would want to go, because Joe said, well, let's just go back for pigs, and I said, do you think Cam would want to go pig hunting with us, and he said, I can 100% say he would. (laughs) (laughs) I've never turned down a, a, a bow hunt. I mean, people could ask you on a bow hunt anything anywhere, and I'll be like, yeah, don't even have to wonder. So, okay, but let's say I, I want to get back into pig Except hunt. turkeys. I want to get back into pig <laughs> hunt more and say this. Let's say I said, for whatever reason, I said, hey, we're going to go down to this place, but here's the deal. Um, on this ranch, by declaration of God and man, you can't hunt with a bow. You would have said, "Nah, I'll stay home." Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I mean, you I don't just have. Don't like shooting. No, I don't have anything against it. I take, yeah, I take people not, yeah. out rifle hunting all the time, and I'm, I love seeing people be successful and being immersed in my lifestyle, which is hunting. I don't separate myself bow hunter. Rifle. I think we're all together. But me personally, I just, just can't get excited about it. I can't. I just love the. Ch- like this morning was perfect. I love spawn stalking, getting in there. You know, you got to look at the animal, the position of the animal. You know, these these boars, they have shields on their shoulders. So you got to think about where that arrow is entering. You got to think about, I just love the strategy of bow hunting and then watching that arrow, you know. Find its mark. Find its mark, drop in. And it's like, I just have, it's just, I'm, just, I'm a bow hunter. That's just all. You know, that's all I am. Man, talking to you, hanging out with you makes me feel like I need to, um, I don't know. <laughs> I say it makes me feel like I do. Like, I'll, I do, like, I do everything, mm-hmm. which means you don't get good at much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I like to go trapping. I like to go predator calling. I like to go deep dropping, <laughs> shallow fishing, ice fishing, You're spear a fishing. Bow hunting, gun hunting, yeah, knife hunt. I mean, you know what I mean, like mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah, and that's and it, I and understand it keeps that. You, it keeps you from ever being. It keeps you from ever being where you're just an absolute master at, at something. some yeah. pursuit. You're j- mm-hmm. jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah, mm-hmm. like you've dedicated yourself to waterfowl hunting. Yeah, right. You know? I mean, it just started getting into the big game. You know? <laughs> so, you know, you did ask if I ever, I think, bird hunt or whatever else, and. I don't. This is all I do. (laughs) Big game bow hunt. That's all I care about. So I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm missing out on experiencing these other, you know, pursuits, which I'm sure are great. And maybe I would grow in some way because of them and maybe interact with people that I wouldn't otherwise. And that would be rewarding, but I don't care about that. (laughs) (laughs) At least you're honest. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned knife hunting, half joking, but then I realized on the subject of pigs, I've done the, um, in New Zealand and Hawaii and in Florida, I've gone out with guys doing the dog Mm -hmm. hunting where you just, in the end, all you're doing is dispatching the pig with a knife. Murdering it. Yeah. With a knife. Uh (laughs) That's what it feels like to me. Oh, it's It's like, I mean, it feels like. It's, it's got to be like somebody, somebody stabbing somebody else. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. And the, the crazy thing about it is you think, like, if you imagine a arrow, a broadhead, as a, it's a knife tip, mm-hmm. you think nothing of delivering that right. knife tip. Isn't that weird? Into the heart of that pig. But, yeah. man, someone sticks that knife in your hand. And you're up close and personal. And yeah. you're like, no, get it right in the heart. It feels... You have to talk yourself into it. Yeah. It's the, the feeling of the pushing it in something. You know, you don't feel that arrow. You're not controlling that arrow by by your hand. So feeling that cut in is a difference. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those times I did it, I like it. it uh, well, I mean, the fact that I went and did it again and again and again. And I've done <laughs> I guess it, it didn't times. upset you too it, much. No, but it really, <laughs> it really drew that question of... Like what, yeah, with a bullet, you don't think about it. An arrow, you don't think about it. But then when you got to do it up close, it just makes you view it differently. Yeah. And that that's actually the thing I want to talk about a little bit with with pigs. 
um earlier i made i made the joke that there's sort of no crime that can be committed against pigs that, that, that some people would feel was gone too far the other day my little boy my older boy got he's now armed with a phone which we have my wife and i have very mixed feelings about but it just it felt like an inevitability he now has a phone so my little boy who's far away from getting a phone comes to me all upset because the thing that his brother showed him who likes watching hunting stuff his thing a brother showed him where they were some video where it's just they were out sounds like they were out with pistols semi-auto pistols in a truck and from the description my little boy gave, he's like, more or less, it was a video about running pigs over with a truck, running them down, hmm. running them over. Hmm. And you see all kinds of things like this. And you go, and it's, it's, compl- it's, it's a complex thing because there is, like, state-sponsored, across wild pig range, there are state-sponsored efforts to eradicate, which is unrealistic, but uh, I, I say that. In some border states, there's a plan to eradicate pigs from the landscape. And in some places, there's just a very concerted effort to control pigs. So you have like state-sponsored pig killing um, where you're just trying to like reduce numbers. The same way they might go to an island in the Galapagos and try to remove goats by any means necessary. Or Whatever, it's a thing that happens. What's that? Cows. Cows, okay. It, it's a thing that happens, but... <laughs> Squirrel. I think kind of like from the fact that when I first started hunting, the first pig hunts I did were like, it was big game hunting for pigs. And so I think that you fall into this thing, like not, not living and growing up in wild pig country. You, it's hard for me to jump into, it's hard for me a little bit to move out of like game animal mindset about pigs into like 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 a basically a larger version of a rat right which for many land managers and play in texas and other states it's like they are they are an overgrown rat yeah vermin you know yeah they're destructive disease vectors hey, play your javelina call is that a heavy or a pig it, it's heavy oh it is okay yeah. hold on man. sorry to interrupt but... oh no you're fine you're fine that's <laughs> what we're here for what was I hitting them with earlier? Uh, squeaky something. But I'm telling you, he, they don't come from that distance. It won't work. Try? I'll try it, but I'm telling you, no. What I've found calling javelinas is you got to be, not, I didn't discover this, but I found that it's true. And it was the guy that makes J13 calls. I mean, it's coming closer. How far away is that, would you say? 250, 300? I, I can tell you. It is 169. Oh. 169. He buggied? No, he's just like obscured behind brush. Let me get back to what I was saying. I'm going to give all the arguments. As, as part of what I'm saying, I'm going to give you all the arguments against pigs. Okay. Disease vectors. Mm-hmm. Um, competition for food with native wildlife. Destroyers of ground nesting birds. So wild native ground resting birds. So destroyers of turkey nests because they eat the eggs. Destroyers of quail nests because they eat the eggs. They are agricultural pests because they till up agricultural ground. They have a negative impact on water quality because they root in the mud and denude banks of vegetation. What else? There's probably more bad things about pigs. Bad hombres. Mm -hmm. But um, I can't get I, I, I can't find my way into the um, I can't find my way into the pig eradication mindset yeah you know I think when I was younger I could easily I didn't really care about I could, oh. I could kill un, oh, unbridled yeah. killing and never think one thing about it now <laughs> like even like if I'm driving and you know how a possum might run across the road or it's like, I don't want to hit a squirrel, a possum. I don't want to hit, I will feel terrible if I hit something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that before when I was a kid, it I was would, almost cool. I couldn't, I don't know. I just, yeah. I mean, I remember we were driving down the logging road, coyote would come out some, for some reason they stay on the road and just 
driving and run them right over. Mm -hmm. I could never do that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think made the the change for you? Ah, uh, just maturing, I think, and just you just, know, yeah, the more I would you, say just growing up. The more you hunt, the more you kill. The I mean, more you one, care about. It's the one thing that's how you you respect life because mm -hmm. you're taking it. Right. You understand, you know, life and death more in a you know more evolved mindset. Um, so that's just part of it, and I, that's one reason I think anti hunters are so misguided. They haven't been involved in the circle of life. You know, they have because they're paying somebody to do their killing for them, but they haven't done the killing themselves. So they don't really respect life. And that's why they threaten people and, you know, threaten people's life for hunting and things like that, just because they don't get it. So it's, that's a big advantage to being a hunter is you, you immerse yourself in this. We have mm -hmm. blood on our hands. So it doesn't mean that we don't care. We care deeply. Um, but it's just part of what we do. So I think that's just, I think it's just part of maturing and, you know, evolving as a hunter. I think one of the parts of it that messes with me a little bit on um, the pig thing is that they are, they're, they can be a little challenging to deal with, but they are edible. And when you go to the store, they're selling pork. Yeah. And so then if you do, uh, you know, to do like eradication efforts, you can't help but look and think, oh man, look at all that. Like I remember my buddy that works at a, my buddy works at a, a place that supplies the grocery stores and now and then they'll have a disaster where something will happen to a truck, you know, and he'll send me pictures like, holy shit. And he'll send me pictures of some giant dumpster full of like food that whatever got wrong temperature, whatever got recalled, whatever. And you look at that. And it strikes you like, yeah, what a waste, man. Yeah. You know, and I remember one time I went to a, a one time I went to a shark, uh, I went to a shark derby and. What's that? It was like a. a, a like a fishing competition. Fishing derby. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. fishing Got competition for sharks. And it surprised me because Mako's are good. But a lot of the guys would bring in blue sharks. And blue sharks have a bad reputation as food. They have a lot of urea, so they kind of have a pissy mm -hmm. smell and pissy mm -hmm. taste to them. But seeing that volume of blue sharks in a dumpster just felt different to me than if I saw a dumpster full of uh, rats, you know? Mm -hmm. And someone's going to point out, well, you need rats. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. like, I don't eat rats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that that's like part of why the hog thing, and even th this spot, like this place we're hunting, this guy's, they got right now too many hogs. I, I've never seen anything like it. It sounds like he's, perhaps never seen this many around he's got too many he's like just try to get rid of them and you still get up there you're like oh man i don't know if i can like shoot more than one just get a whole bunch yeah. like i can't jump out of big game mode on pigs you know probably largely from being from the north yeah is there two of them now yeah that's a i i mean even when i killed that that boar today it's like i feel the same as if i kill, killed a bull you know, it's just, I still respect that life and it still impacts me. I killed it. I'm, I'm, that was the goal to kill a pig. Mm -hmm. I did it, but I still respect that. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know why I think that's just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I just know I'm getting softer in my old age. I guess. Did you feel that happen to you? Yeah. yeah. Human. I just yeah. wonder why, why we think of that as soft, you know? Yeah. For example, as opposed to um, just more thoughtful yeah. about it, you know? I think right. it's, I think it's, you, because I'd say the same thing. I think it's soft relative to what you were. Right. Yeah. Soft relative to what you were. Yeah. I, I, I feel better about it. I mean, it doesn't feel good sometimes. And I mean, I, I don't, it doesn't feel bad, but I mean, I feel like it's a more honest approach than what I, how I looked at things when I was younger. I think that when I was younger, I was immature and I wasn't seeing the, the full scope of what it meant to be a hunter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was just, oh, we just kill shit. Yeah. I, I've noticed in my older age, I guess, only 32, not old, but, mm -hmm. um, soft, but not old. <laughs> 
Hey, we're going to freaking wrestle after if this. <laughs> if he's soft, what am I? Well, if this is his hard, if this is the apex of hardness, then it only gets soft from here. <laughs> after that stare down there, <laughs> Avelina, I don't know. This is not a good future. <laughs> um, I've noticed, like, dispatching animals in traps uh-huh. is, like, not as easy as it used to be. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've, if you've ever got that way or f- feel that way, but, like... I'm it, don't get me wrong. I'll still I'm still gonna trap and kill yeah. animals in like feet away from me in a trap where they can't get away. But it just like something about it feels different these days. Man, it's interesting you bring that up because I noticed that. Like I used to, if I used to come up on something, if I when I was you know high school, early college, and really trapping hard, and if I came up on a fox that I caught, I couldn't get that thing dead quick enough. Yeah, not out of like getting it over with. It was just jubilation. Oh, yeah. Zero thought. Mm-hmm. And now there's a little bit of a, oh, man. Yeah. Should I let this guy go? <laughs> like that coyote that we caught mm-hmm. this year, just walking up on it, and that thing, like, it ain't getting away from you. No. But yeah. with that being said, like, I'm going to do it again next year. Yeah. It is like a, yeah. It's You're probably inter- allowing yourself to, uh, I don't know whether it's projection or accepting reality. Like you're looking at something that in the moment is helpless and you know, yeah, it's, just look, it's, you're you just, just allowing yourself to feel it. Yeah. My wife more and more, uh, thinks that my wife more and more thinks that, um, this is sort of like overriding theory that, that we're governed by, uh, we're governed by fear of death. As you get older, you know, she tries and to pin, she tries is. to pin hmm. a lot of stuff on fear of death. Hmm. I don't I don't think about myself at all in those moments. I mean, I don't know if it's subconsciously I am, but to me personally it doesn't feel like that's what's going on. But Yeah. Maybe subconsciously. I, I agree with that. Yeah, I I just when I'm when I'm about to kill a coyote in a trap, I'm not, I don't I it feels like I'm not thinking about personal death. Another thing my wife just told me has nothing to do with hogs or killing. Is it? She said, "There is no baby named Steve." <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> yeah. So you, she said, "You would never in a million years go to someone's house, and there's a baby, and they're going. You're like, oh, what's the baby's name? They would never in a million years go. It's Steve. <laughs> that baby's name is Steve." <laughs> Turn it into a old man's name. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. Someone found a... Oh, I should have put it in talking points because we have no reception. I won't be able to insert it. But someone found uh, a quote. I think it was from a Japanese author translated um, about the baby face, old man face. Mm. Someone wrote in about the, that. The, they the, like the, identified the, youngest, the passage. The youngest babies have the oldest face. Yeah, yeah. there was, but there was a, there was something similar, but it was in a, in, in a book by a Japanese author. Oh. I'll, I'll show that to you. So that's on my mind that the world's going to run out of Steves. <laughs> so either you were born with some other name, or you were born thirty years old. Which one was it? When I was a kid. <laughs> When I was a kid, if you said Steve, if the teacher said Steve, six kids are going to raise their hand. Yeah. And if they said Jenny, six, seven kids are going to raise their hand. Hmm. Now it's it could just, be boys raise their know, hand for Jenny. You know, it's just, it, or could variations happen. on Caden, and then <laughs> you have to just know Steve anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Steve's are gone. Steve, the heir of Steve's. Is, I hate dead. <laughs> I hated my name when I was a kid. I was like, why can't I just be like a Mike or a John? Oh, you didn't want to be Cam? Really? Cam. Nobody's named Cam. Is Did they run around calling you Cam? Yeah. Uh, Cam or Cameron? Cam. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe some girls would say Cameron. But, yeah. Cam. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a stupid it's a good name. name. <laughs> I like it. It's it's a little more accepted now, but... It's kind of so fitting, though, because you're such a bow hunter, you know? Just Cam. Cam's on a bow. Yeah. I don't know. You ever think about so. that? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no. Could have been named Riser or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Arrow. Arrow. <laughs> Broadhead. <laughs> Could have passed through. <laughs> passed through. <laughs> it's actually a good dog Stabilizer. name. Stabilizer. 
So yeah. Cam, what uh, what's going on in the world of we kind of uh, I'm familiar with what's going on in the world with you with hunting because we just hunted this morning. What's going on with your uh, your running career, your your running passion? Mm. Uh, it's uh, you know, I'm not getting any younger. Yeah, but you but when do you jump like uh, where where do you sit within your age bracket? Because that's got the thing you that's got to be a thing you start paying attention to, right? I don't know. I don't really like that. That seems you don't like, like a, that? seems like a cop out. It's like, you know, I still want to beat all the young guys. Okay. Yeah. Like being the fastest old guy would be like being, I can't say it. it used to be, there's a saying being the smartest. I can't say it now. It's like you get canceled if you say it. <laughs> oh, <Yeah. laughs> don't say that. No. Yeah. So that's like what being a fast old guy's like, uh, huh. so I, I just, you know, I in my age group, yeah, of course I do good because most people my age are dead. How do but, the age brackets work? <laughs> uh, it goes, it, I mean, masters is forty and over, but then there's age groups within masters, so it'd be like senior masters. No, it'd be like fifty to fifty four, fifty five to fifty nine. Oh, so they cut it thin. Yeah, yeah. So to, uh-huh. oh. and this is for like you, the the what do you call them the the races you run. Oh, the ultras, ultras don't really have, most good ultra runners are old. Oh, really? Yeah. When you're young, you're faster and more able, but you're not mentally tough. So if you're going to run 200 miles, a young 20 year old is going to usually shit the bed way before the end. Is that right? Really? Yeah. So when you're, uh, when you're older, um, you're just, you know, life has been, you've been kicked in the balls a lot, you know? So you've been just a hard race is just like, this is just, I'm, this is temporary. I'm going to get through it. So you're just more mentally tough. Young guys just haven't developed that mental toughness yet. Really? You think so? Oh, I know for a fact. That's why I jumped yeah, when the Havilina came in. Right? But it's young guys, <laughs> I guess it's like a different caliber yeah. of young guys, but it's young guys that go through like the, the, the ranger course and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, there is. It's uh, that's an extreme, though, like right? buds or something. Yeah. Those guys are they're in the special category. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking in general. Yeah, you know, I'm with you. Yeah, there's of course there's tough, like elite. Oh well, special op or what is that? Special operations. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's always freaks out there, and there's there's young freaks too. I'm just saying in general, when you're young, you're not mentally yep. as tough as you are when you're older. What is the prime age for the old? What, what do you call? I mean, you don't call it ultra marathon. Like what do you call ultra it? marathon? Yeah. You do call it, yeah, or and endurance. that's how, how long a, is but an there's ultra? There's an off road, but it's like off road. Yeah, it's trail. But yeah. is there like is there ultra marathon? It's that's on road, or are they always off because the road's too hard. No, I mean, there's, on your body. no, there's some on the road too, oh, it's, there are. but that does beat you up for sure. I mean, the mountains kind of give you, it's, it's hard because you got the climb, but you are using different muscles at different times when it's like, there's a race called Badwater 135 and yeah. it's 135 miles in Death Valley. Most of it is on road, which gets like 130 degrees. You have to run on the white line. Oh, Otherwise your shoes wow. are melting. What? what? Yeah. Jeez. Jeez. Yeah. It's intense. It's intense. Holy so God. that on the road, very tough. And it's the same muscles for 135 miles. Have you done that one? I haven't done that one. Yeah. No, I want to. Um, so general, generally ultras are in the mountains, but they're, it, they don't have to be, is my point. Got and it. And to answer your question, Seth, a uh, ultra marathon would be anything over a normal marathon. So an ultra gotcha. marathon could range from a 50K, which is about 31 miles. That's the shortest ultra, 31 miles to... I've done 200, the Moab 240 is 240 miles. Hmm. Jeez. And that, how, how long does that take you? That took 78 hours. Are you sleeping at all? Uh, two hours. So the clock doesn't stop. The best people like Courtney, who I run with, she, I'm trying to think how long she slept in that one. She won that race. I got like maybe 11th. Now I can't remember, but um, 11th, you count 11th in your age group or just 11th? No, 11th. Overall. So you're yeah. not in that age group. Dude, no. I would run with that age group stuff hard, man. It, it doesn't, it, that, that doesn't work on ultras. Cause I'm telling you there's old, there's in, old dudes that, tear it up. in that race, there was like a 60 year old woman who beat me. Okay. Really? This freak, Pam Reed. Wow. She is so good. And women, I'll just say this. 
women and for for uh, like elite endurance athletes, women are. I'm not going to say they're better than they're better than most men. The toughest women are better than the than a lot of the best men because they're just so much. I think they're built for pain for because of childbearing. I think they're they deal with pain better than men do. That's why Courtney is one mm-hmm. races outright over elite men. Wow. And she's, you know, she's not going to be faster. Men will have, you know, will be faster, be stronger in general over women, but for endurance, it's women have an advantage. Mm. So, when you're doing that at what point at, at what point do you have a sense that you're going to do well? You know, in in a given race. Like if I go out, if I'm out and I got to hike up a mountain for whatever reason, messing around, hunting, whatever. I'll pretty quickly in the day know that I'm going to tear it up or I'll be like, man, this, this should, this should not feel like it feels. Yeah. Those races, because you got seven, eight hours to figure it out. Mm-hmm. So you can start off feeling like shit. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot, a lot of time left to recover. Okay. So yeah, you just keep and, and in a race like that. I've went, um, first 200 miler I did the Bigfoot 200s in Washington, which is freaking super tough. The trails there don't have many switchbacks like they do in a lot of the Western states for, for horse, um, packers. Uh, a lot of those trails will have switchbacks in Washington for whatever reason, not many switchbacks. So you'd gain 5,000 feet and it'd be just straight up the hill, Mm -hmm. just ass kicker. But in that race, I went. And in most long races like this, you're up and down, up and down, problem solving, don't have enough salt, need more salt, need more calories, need more, you know, get dehydrated. And that one, I was winning by hours, like I think three hours in the first 40 miles because I went out too fast, got dehydrated, then freaking died, then came back. And by the end of the race, my brother was pacing me, who is an, an amazing runner. Taylor is his name. He's a, he's won ultras outright. Um, he was pacing me at the very end and I was running so good by the end. He's like, Cam, I don't, I can't keep up. I was running six something minute miles after 200 miles Holy after I could barely shit. walk at sometimes during the same race. <laughs> yeah. oh my so God. you just learn what your body can do. But yeah, to answer your question, you can start off and like, I don't know how this is going to work out, but you're going to, it's going to be up and down no matter what. You might start off great and then feel like, you know, after a hundred miles, which is, you know, probably going to be 24 to 30 hours, you might feel like I can't take another step. And then you keep going and you do your body's incredible. People don't realize. No. I mean, I, I like, I, I look at that stuff and, uh, I look at that stuff. Like I can walk good, like good long distances. I look at that stuff with running and I just can't, cause even now and then I'll be like, I'll run back to the car and grab the whatever keys yeah you know then you get where you can see the car and all of a sudden you're walking (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know what i mean it's just like something something in my body is like what are we running for let's just walk fast (laughs) yeah i mean it you know i just for me it's given me so much confidence because when i was first hunting the eagle cap wilderness is kind of where i came of age as a mountain hunter I was by myself, so I was scared, you know, I was scared back there sometimes. And I was like, mm. God damn, this, this freaking, these mounds are kicking my ass just mentally, physically, spiritually. It's like, I'm thinking about my kids at home, you know, little thinking about, I should be home. I'm here. It's like all these. And I just feel when I got mentally stronger, I was like, that wilderness was 30 miles wide by 60 miles long. It's 387,000 acres. They call it the little Alps. It's very rugged. And I was like, I just, what can I do to get tougher? So I started running and I, Mm. and I thought if I could run a hundred miles, finish this hundred mile ultra. First one I did was, uh, the Bighorn 100 in Wyoming. What year was that? That was 2009. If I could run a hundred miles, I could get out of the, all the way through the wilderness in one day. Why would I be? So that Mm. gave me so much confidence. I could go back there. Wouldn't think anything about being fearful or. I just was felt so capable. So then I was like, instead of worrying about, I got to make it back to camp or I, or if I have camp on my back, how much water do I have? Do I have enough food? What's this weather doing? You know, there was, I didn't have a satellite phone or anything like that. 
But in, once I got that confidence, I didn't worry about any of that shit. All I worried mm. about was I need to kill a bull. And when, when all you, your hundred percent focus is on killing a bull, not everything that can go wrong, all these things you can't control, not a, and, yeah. Like if I get it now, it's going to be dark. Right. You don't. And then how am I going to, I got to cut it up. And then what am I going to do? Cause it's going to be warm. Maybe I'll, yeah. And, oh, there they are tonight. I'll come back in the morning. I'll make a plan. I just would go a hundred percent focused on killing every single time I saw something. I didn't care how far it was. I'd go and I killed. And it was just like, it was that confidence. Mm -hmm. And that, then that has carried over to everything now. Yeah. But, everything. But that ultra had that, that ultra mindset, um, I think facilitated that growth. Did it change how you, did it change you socially? Uh, yeah. I mean, I pretty much look at everybody and think, yeah, oh, you're a pussy. You can't. <laughs> 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 no, it, but it does. When you hear people complain about certain things, I mean, I think anybody who does, you know, fighters probably feel like the, feel this way. Like my son who is a ranger probably feels this way. You hear normal complaints and you're like, is that really worth complaining about? Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cause it's really not that, it's not that bad. So it, it just gives you perspective over what's hard and what's not, not really judging people. I mean, I don't, I, I, no, everybody I has their own. I asked you, I asked you, everybody has their own threshold. I'm not, I don't look down, you know, something that's hard for somebody. It's hard for them. I can't tell them it's not hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard for them. What do you, when you're in one of those mega long races, what, uh, at what point does it start to feel like it's, it's a hundred percent mental? Um, it depends on, you know, if you put in the miles. So the general rule of thumb is the weekly mile mileage you get should match your race. So if you've mm. been getting in a hundred mile weeks, you should be prepared for a hundred miler. This is roughly. Got it. So yeah, to get, I, a, I hadn't heard this before to yeah. get in a hundred mile weeks, you have to, that's 14 miles a day. So you run 14 miles a day, you're getting a hundred mile. If you can run 14 miles a day, because most people. Are you talking a seven day week? Seven day week. Yeah. Yep. Every day. So you, you, you have to get your body used to those big back to back days because in those long races, you're running for multiple days. Most people, if you go run a half marathon, I mean, you're down for a while. Mm -hmm. Your body can get accustomed to day after day after day. And then like there's some, you know, so I get hundred miles a week and then I, I'll do uh, even bigger weeks. Like I'll try to do, I go through stretches where I'll do a marathon a day and that, that would be, you know, 200 miles over 200 miles a week. That's to me, I think that's what it takes to prepare your body to push like that. Because in a race where you're not sleeping, you're not recovering, you might feel good for 30 miles, which is still a long ass run. But at 30 miles on a 240 mile race, you have 210 miles left. Mm -hmm. What are you going to, so you're feeling like shit for most of the race. Yeah, yeah. You can't train. And as soon as you start feeling like shit, stop. Cause that's where most of the race is taking place. So it's just a matter of building your body up to be able to endure that, that, uh, I mean, just what you're asking of it. It's, it's yeah, a lot. At, at the end, are you, toward the end, are you still doing that? Oh, you need salt. You need water. You need calories. You're at a point where you just, you're just going to finish it and not think. You can't. You, you still got to be like, you, a, can't you do still that. like flying. You still got to be like flying a helicopter, paying attention to everything. Yeah, the whole time. You uh -huh. can, once you stop thinking about food or calories, hydration and salt, you're pretty much done. Okay. It has, you can never, sometimes you get in a groove and you don't take in that stuff every hour. You pay for it. Got it. You have to keep those, those three things up. Yeah. Uh, on a different subject, you today were mentioning to me that, you know, you, you like, uh, still hunting and then moving into like stocks. Right. And you were talking about hunting with a friend of yours. Who's a good caller. And when your friend says, well, let's try to call that bull, you'll think to yourself, let's try to, why don't we just sneak down there and try to get it? Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, I think it's just used to, I, I was used to growing up on public land in that wilderness and, and everywhere I hunted, even before the wilderness, it was like 
20 minutes from Eugene or Springfield is where I would elk hunt. Very accessible. There's big bulls there. There'd be articles on the paper. Got, we lived on that road. So opening day of deer season, there'd be 300 trucks going by. Mm -hmm. So you get used to hunting amongst other people. When you're elk hunting amongst other people, you don't call because those bulls have been called so many times. Got so it. I grew up never calling because you blew on, I mean, even if you were good, those bulls are probably not going to react. Um, so I was just so used to, and I gained a lot of confidence and I can just, cause to me getting down on an elk is way easier than stalking a big mule deer. Mm -hmm. Mule deer are so much harder to stalk just how they, they're more aware how they bed because the bow hunter generally will wait, wait for them to bed. And then you plan your stock, you get the wind, right? Very difficult. And elk, they're so noisy. They're so big. They're more of a dominant figure on the landscape. So they're not quite as skittish as I, I don't think, especially like a white tail. It just, to me, I had a lot of success and just got really good at stocking. And so I've never had to, I, I hardly ever call. I've killed a lot of bulls and probably 90% of them were spawn stock. When they're better, you're doing them when they're feeding or anytime. whatever, the, anything you can. Anytime. Yeah. Just whatever they're doing. Uh huh. Yeah. So it's just, you know how hunting is, is you're just reading body language. You're reading body language, terrain, you know, that pig today, you can, pigs are, you know, they're not very aware, especially now that I think they're so focused on feeding because it's been so dry, but you just, you watch the the animals, you see what you can get away with. You stay in the shadows, you use the, whatever covers available. You go very slow. You're not, your arms aren't out you're kind of in line. Your, your legs aren't taking big steps. And that profile is barely moving. If you're going right to them and you just all that weighs in and then you get into bow range, you wait for the right position and then you kill them. And that's just what I do on, on everything. And, and elk are, very susceptible to stalking, I think. What is, what's your attitude or not your attitude? What's your approach when you're, when you're in a big old like grab ass party with a couple bulls and 10 cows and everybody's running, you know, moving around tons of eyeballs. Do you just sit it out to wait or you get in there and mix it up? No, I mean, it, it depends if the, if the bull, if there's a dominant bull there, like usually I'm just going to kill the biggest, oldest bull. So, I'll get in and I mean, I'm thinking like I, a good example was two years ago. I was, uh, I had somebody could have called for me this bull. I could hear it was up on this bench. So calling, it's not going to come off the bench. He, I could, I knew he had his herd up there. He's not coming off a bench to come to a call, mm -hmm. right? He had elevation. They're always going to want to keep that elevation. So I'm like, he's not going to come to the call. I need to get back up on that bench. So I got up on the bench and it was really thick up there. And I, he came around, he was going like working the bench and then going on the edge of the bench down towards the drainage. He would call there cause they want to announce that they're badasses and they want everybody to know. So he would go to that edge of it. I was on the hillside edge where I came up and I saw him come up and he raked this tree about I don't know, 35 yards away, but facing me and I didn't have a shot. And then he left and then he went back down to the edge of the bench over the drainage called. And then he started to come back around in the, in amongst or during this time, there's a couple of cows and they're feeding and they would get there and their uh, cows were like 20 yards. So in that case, I'm just saying he's coming back. I know what he's doing. I just got to hope this wind holds wind was coming up at this time is mid morning. And I got to, hope that this wind holds, I'm just going to stay here. And so I stayed there. Uh, Brendan Shockey was there filming me and, uh, I, I just stayed for probably, I don't know, it was probably 25 or 30 minutes. And eventually those cows fed up to about 10 yards. And so I just knew that if this whole held, I was going to, you know, wait him out, he would come up and he came up to about 21 yards and I slipped an arrow through the brush and, and killed him. So it's, uh, it just depends. That was just a situation where I, I was just weighing out what I thought was going on. What were the best odds f for me to get that bull killed? Mm -hmm. And then that's how it happened. Um, you know, if there's satellite bulls around, it's, he's going to run them off. I mean, he's going to run, he's going to He's not going to let a satellite bull get close to his cows without, 
him coming in and letting him know who runs the show. So it's just, but you, as you you know, as well as I do, and most of your listeners, you're just, every situation is unique. Oh, you yeah. Know? And I, I, you know, I kind of laugh sometimes when people, you know, they act like they got this species or this animal figured out. It's like every single time is different. There's tendencies, but you don't have it figured out. You, you, you've uh, developed and noticed habits, but every situation, because of that, bi- if that bench wasn't there, it would have been something else. It would have mm-hmm. been so, yep, yep. something else going, or if that, or if I was above them instead of below them, maybe he would have come up that bench to me. But it's like, I mean, it's a, it's a chess game every single time. Mm. I just love that part of it. And I've, I don't have it figured out, but I have figured out good decisions to make to put the odds in my favor. Well, that's, that's part of what I think figuring out is, is if you've exposed yourself to enough situations, you start to put together a kind of probability calculator. Mm-hmm. It's, I, it, it's like your crystal ball. I'm big on numbers. Oh yeah. I'm <laughs> always running numbers and I'm always like, it's, I, I, it's probably, I, I was a uh, purchasing, purchasing agent from 20 years at the local utility back home. And I would look at everything like a calculation. So it's just odds and just numbers and just running. And I just, so I'm always looking at how much time I've been in this area, what the wind's going to do what this, you know, just like just running it in my head, like. But anyway, yeah, it's just probability, mm-hmm. I think, is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, it's just getting in and saying, you're not, you're not able to, you don't, you're not going, well, that one time this happened, another time that happened, another time that happened. It's just, I have a feeling. Yeah. Based on experience. Yeah. I have a feeling that that thing, that thing's going to come back up here again. Yeah. You know, and then they all run down the hill. And you're like, <laughs> or whatever. Right? Guess I was wrong that time. I'll yeah. get him next time. I mean, it's not like it's, you know, it's not like it's a slam dunk, but anytime, you know, people, I do, I do a lot of elk hunting. So I get some bulls on the ground. People say it's too much, this or this or that. But, but the point, the point is, it's like, uh, oh man, now I don't even know what my point was. I'm sorry. Uh, what, 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 what did you just say? I said, well, you, you think I was saying I was joking that you're convinced or thinking it's going to come back this way, but I said then they all run down the hill. Oh yeah. Um. Actually, now I don't even remember what I was going to say. So sorry about that. Oh no, it's quite. But, right. It's getting but, dark out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. Sorry about the cameras. It's just running out of light. No, it's oh, we're really? we're doing yeah. audio, audio yeah. only. <laughs> well, audio we're just only. gonna have to like cut halfway and just. This, this is one on problem we haven't thought of with our studio. It needs we need to be full moon only. <laughs> hey, full moon only. Remember the bounce. You only. need the bounce. Bounce off that moon wherever it is. Yeah, yeah. But no, it's a. Uh, oh, no, no, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, people make it seem like uh, you know. I, I don't want to say people have it figured out, and I don't. So I'll never say I have it figured out every time. But it's not like it's impossible. I mean how many guys kill bulls every year? Yeah. A lot. We were talking so, about the, the other day when it gets to be September and, and you see like the pictures, yeah. everybody's standing in and you're seeing, you're like, how is everybody yeah. getting a bull? <laughs> yeah. Well, so I got to go look at the people right around me and go, did you get a bull? No. Okay, good. So somebody, <laughs> <laughs> somebody did. So somebody but didn't get a bull. It, I mean, it's challenging. It's hard. It's 10% success. I get all that, but it's not like it's impossible. Mm-hmm. So, if 10% of guys, some of them aren't prepared, some of them are prepared, but if if you can go out and you get lucky and kill, imagine what you can do if you focus your whole life on it. Sure. You know what I mean? It's not it's not like we're saying, oh, you're going to try to do this thing no man has ever done. <laughs> okay. It's going to be tough. We're doing something guys do every year. So if, if another man can do it, I know I can do it. Yeah. So it's just... Good, making good decisions, putting yourself in, in position for success and, you know, basing all this experience you have, it can happen. It can happen often. Mm-hmm. So that's how that, I look at that it. That used to be the, the only pep talk I knew was, um, it only takes one. Mm-hmm. And then there's like another pep talk of reminding myself how fast things can turn around. Yep. 
And then the other pep talk is the old, like, uh, well, we're not going to kill him in the truck. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, you know. Which are all very pragmatic pep talks. <laughs> yeah. Roy used to say that all, all the time to my buddy Roy, who got me started bow hunting, as we mentioned. But uh, sometimes he would say, I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to be out there. Yeah. Hmm. All, you can, all you can control is where you're at. If you're out there, who knows what's going to happen? There's always a chance. And so, yeah, he would just wouldn't know what to do. You know, everybody likes to think they have it exactly figured out. Any hunter knows you don't always have it figured out. And you feel like, I feel there's been hunts where I'm like, I don't know how I've ever killed anything. It feels impossible. Mm -hmm. But when you're out there, yeah, it can turn on a dime. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think hunting teaches that optimism, uh, that optimis optimistic mindset almost better than anything hmm. because you have to believe if you don't believe you're at home, yeah. you're at home, you're talking on social media, talking shit about guys who killed. Yeah. So <laughs> if you're optimistic, you're not worried about any of that. You're out there and it's like, I'm going to make something happen. Maybe I should combine those pep talks <laughs> and it would be, it only takes one. It happens so fast. You can't get them in the truck. <laughs> yeah. It happens so fast. It, it can happen. Oh, so fast. yeah. It turn on a dime. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just like all of a sudden, there it is. You know. Yeah. How many times have you had that feeling? I've had. I've been. Where like, you're like, oh my god, I can't believe it. I thought well, we'd never. You know. I've more often had the feeling of please, please, can I just have a break, please? <laughs> I mean, I deserve. I deserve this. No. I've worked so hard. Please, can I have a break? That's what I'm. I'm more used like, to that. I feel like that happens a lot of time. <laughs> turkey hunting in the springtime, oh. like walking around, not hearing a single gobble the whole morning, and then like you're walking back to the truck, and one gobbles back where you just came from, and you're like, "Well, better go chase him." Yeah, yeah. The, I had. Oh, go ahead. The, the one hunt that we do that every time I'm like, I just cannot picture this happening. <laughs> is that moves. is that moose hunt? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That can't picture. I, uh, just, just to close, um, so a few years ago, me and Yanni went to Missouri for the turkey opener and it was the coldest, snowiest, windiest morning. And it was like, so winter time. I mean, you couldn't find a, there wasn't a bud on a tree and we went out and split up and I went off one direction. Yanni went off another direction. This, this big chunk of, of, uh, I can't remember who administered it. It was it was public land, but it wasn't like national forest land. It was some other kind of public land, uh, like county land or something. Either way, I'm out there and I've and I talk myself into that you just can't hunt in these conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds brutal. Well, over on the next, uh, over on the next hillside, all of a sudden. You son of a bit. No, not a gobble. Oh, not a, a gobble. Shotgun. <laughs> shotgun. Okay. I was going to say. <laughs> and me, I'm over here saying every, like, that it would, it, you, it, it's too windy, snowy, spring, and over on the next ridge, unbeknownst to me, Yanni is working a hot gobbler. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> and kills it. And I'm like, dude, you know, like the mindset, man. Yeah. Do you it, know? Yeah, you're determining that it's like we might as well go home, and then he's working a hot gobbler on the next ridge. Talk about like the two different guys with the different attitudes. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, that reminds me. I read I read this old story just on the podcast the other day, a solo podcast. I like I like hearkening back on uh, just good reading or good writers or old books like Life at Full Drop, Chuck Adams, just old stuff that you know people don't talk about these days. So I read this old article. Roy and Dwight Shue were hunting on Kodiak mm -hmm. and they got stuck there for 23 days. They were supposed to be there, I think 12, but the weather had the river fro froze and a plane is supposed to, where we hunt on Kodiak, plane drops us off on this river. They land on, on floats, but it froze. So they were stuck. Um, but anyway, this nasty weather came in and Roy always felt like he was going to be able to, it didn't matter. It did not matter what the situation was. So Dwight said he was, Dwight Shu wrote this article. He was trying to keep up with Roy. Roy's going up the hill and Roy's a big guy. I mean, you would look at him and you would think that this, is this guy supposed to be a stud? Biggest stud you've ever seen. Or not ever seen, because you wouldn't think that. Biggest stud you, I've ever hunted with. But anyway, 
Roy's going up the hill. Dwight, who's very capable, could barely keep up with him. And he said, while Roy was going up the trail and and Dwight was struggling to keep up, Roy killed a buck and a red fox <laughs> with his with his bow. <laughs> so and th- so then that sets the stage for this other one. The the wind was howling so bad that they could barely see. Roy said, "I'm I still got a buck tag. I'm going to go out." So they find this buck on this hillside, just covered. The buck was getting covered with snow, but it was blowing off enough where it was bedded down there. You know, these bucks on Kodiak are tough. Roy gets 40 yards away, and Dwight said he couldn't even watch Roy. He was supposed to be filming him, but he had to look away because the, the snow was coming and stinging his face so bad. He could not, and he couldn't show his hands, so he's turning. He said Roy was sitting there bare hands because it's hard to shoot with gloves on if you're not used to it. And bare face and sitting there 40 yards. And I think for two hours, finally that buck stood up and Dwight couldn't even face. He had to have his back to Roy, but buck stood up. Roy killed it. (laughs) Who who the hell else would be out? You couldn't see anywhere. Snow whipping. You've been stuck there for three weeks, basically. Mm -hmm. Roy still had that tag and went and filled it. And so anyway, that's... I mean, that's the kind of attitude it takes sometimes. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people don't have. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have it when I was running after the armadillo. No, you did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that Max next facing time. Down that, and Max facing down that javelina. <laughs> hey. Yeah, you guys okay. faltered. <laughs> Man, if you guys okay. could, could have hunted with Roy, oh, I would give anything for that. He was like, he made everybody better. Everybody is. Like he's so optimistic, it just changes it. It changes people. Sounds like I would have been a bow hunter now. What you would have? Yeah, if I got a chance oh, to hunt with Roy. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he was a stud. No, you speak of him fondly, man. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for joining. It's pitch black out. We're gonna shut her down. <laughs> <laughs> this outside studio needs four walls and some lights. <laughs> well, well, wait. I want to say thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Meat Eater, for allowing me to come here. It's an honor to be on the podcast. I told you yesterday we did Rogan's podcast. I think you and Joe are like the most powerful voices in hunting. And it's just, it's an honor to be able to finally hunt with you. Oh, thanks, man. And uh, spend time with, with your crew and all the guys. You know, I mean, it's it's just, I can't express how thankful I am. Oh, well, thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, it's it. Been thanks, great for, yeah, thanks it's for including been that. Super it's fun. Been a lot of fun. Learned a lot from you. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Cam. <laughs> Stop, we'll